Hi, McCoyne. Uh, we'll be calling this meeting to order. It is 7 p.m. This is our regular meeting. Um, I would like to thank everyone who is in attendance or who is watching later. Um, welcome and thank you for showing up. Um, I would like to have the board members introduce themselves. We'll be starting on my left with member Chastain. Good evening, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I'm LaRonda Chastain. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh. It's, it's Tuesday. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just progr I'm advancing the week. Uh, Sean Wilson. Good evening, Doug Brooks. Good evening, Anupam Chuksadu. Thanks for being here. Hi, it's Patrick Keo. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, hello, Lauren Christensen. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Superintendent Merritt, would you like to introduce yourself and your staff? Yes, good evening and welcome. I'd like to begin by just giving a quick update on our uh, dear Diane Robertson, who we know um, is, uh, will be out on a medical leave for six weeks, but just know that I shared all of your goodwill with her. Mm -hmm. She is doing well now and resting at home. We miss her a lot. I want to share, though, that our lovely Liz Adams has come back to stand in the gap and we appreciate her so much. She'll be here on a part-time basis helping us out in the office and supporting your needs as well and she'll be here for our board um, meetings to take our minutes. So thank you Liz Adams and we have to now say we have two Liz's so we have to go by Liz VG and Liz Adams again. I'd like to uh, ask the remaining members of staff to introduce themselves to you beginning with Mr. Brandon. And good evening, everyone. Nick Brandon, Executive Director of Communications and Marketing. Welcome. Good evening, Kurt Tiskowitz, Executive Director of Student Services. Hi, I'm Debbie Piaz. I'm the Chief Finance and Operations Officer. Good evening, Beth Rail, Chief Academic Officer. Thanks for being here. Welcome, Liz Vartanian Gibbs, Human Resources. All right, so we will stand and do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. All right, I am looking for a motion um, for the adoption of the agenda and approval of consent agenda, action item 221021. Madam President, I move that we adopt the agenda, approve the consent agenda, action item number 22-11-21. Thank you. Second. All right, it's been moved by members to do and seconded by member Brooks that we adopt the agenda and approve the consent agenda. Um, would you like to take us through it, please? Thank you, President McCoy. This evening, our consent agenda consists of human resources transactions since our last time together. We have new hires, leaves, and retirements for your consideration. In addition, we have the approval of minutes from our regular meeting on October the 26th and our special meeting on October the 27th. Finally, we have first readings of policies. Uh, Bylaw 0166, that's agenda. Bylaw 0167.3, public participation at board meetings, and policy 8402, emergency operations plan. All right, thank you so much. I will call for the vote. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed say no. The agenda's been approved. Dr. Vartanian Gibbs. Thank you, President McCoyne. Good evening, and I would like to welcome two new teachers to our school district. First, Lauren Kors Corsi. Lauren will be our new engineering and physics teacher at Salem High School. She comes to us with a bachelor's degree from Wayne State University and a master's degree from Eastern Michigan University in over 10 years of experience. Welcome, Lauren. Okay, and next I'd like to introduce you to Shay Hyde. Shay is going to be our new English language teacher for the Middle School Virtual Academy. She comes to us with her bachelor's degree from Michigan State University and also with over a year experience. So welcome, Shay. We are very glad that you have also selected Plymouth Canton Community Schools. Great. So thank you, Lauren and Shay, and we are very happy that you will be working with us. Next, I would like to congratulate Janita Porter she has held many different positions in our district, but the last position she held was assistant technology specialist. She is retiring, so congratulations to Janita, and thank you for your 18 years in Plymouth Canton Community Schools. Uh. All right, 
thank you so very much, and thank you for choosing us. Uh, we are now on to letter B, which is celebrating success. It is member Chastain. Good evening again, everybody. I'm so excited to be able to do the celebrating success tonight. Tonight we are celebrating in honor of Doug Squires, a, po a Plymouth community member who has selflessly volunteered his time and talent to do something so awesome and amazing as fix toys for the Bird Elementary School playground. Generous volunteers like Doug add so much value to our community and bring such a positive light to our students, staff, and families, especially during challenging times like these. I'd like to invite Bird Elementary School Principal, Mr. George Hill, to the podium to share more about Mr. Squire's service to the community. Thank you, Board Member Chastain. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to assist you in honoring Mr. Squires today. I want to give you a little bit of background about how I came to, um, uh, to know Mr. Squires. So at Bird School, we have two sandboxes that stay open um, for the school day and also for the community after hours and on the weekends. So the kids enjoy playing those in those sandboxes. We have some, I don't want to call them antiques, for lack of a better <laughs> word, <laughs> little tykes and Fisher Price toys like the bulldozers, the backhoes. The kids love them. You can't find them anymore. They're only on eBay. So I believe Mr. Squires was on the, in our community at the playground mm -hmm. with his grandkids. He decided to take some of those toys home and repair them. So since he and I first became acquainted, he has quietly come and gone from bird school many times and used his own money and his own tools and his own workshop to repair the toys for the students. Now, some people think he's just repairing toys. Well, one thing that I noticed about the sandboxes at bird school, some of our highest need students love those sandboxes. They make friends. They learn how to socialize and play in that sandbox. And so um, I really thought this was a good way to recognize him, and um, I'm so grateful that he cared enough about our community to, to stop by and help us. Um, mm -hmm. He also fixed our, we have a handicap digger because we have a couple students in a wheelchair, and he also fixed that better than it came from the manufacturer. So okay. it is my honor to be here, and I'm so yes. glad that he's a part of Plymouth and the Bird School community. Thank you so much, Mr. Hill. We are certainly appreciative of the words that you shared. So on behalf of the school board or the Board of Education, I would like to present Doug Squires with the Volunteer in Public Schools Award for his generosity and service to the community in this special way. And so I want to know whether or not you'd like to come up and share some words, Mr. Squires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't live very far from here, and I walk by Bird probably almost every, every, every day. So I just kind of look over there, and if I see something that looks like it needs fixed, that's what I do. Oh. So. We thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank So nice. Mm -hmm. Some people I say, we have oh, more neighbors that. like that. Yes. Yeah. I was going to tell Hill to hang out, but I'm going to give him a shout out on this one. All right. So now we are on to uh, board committee reports and action. First up is the president's report. So we had a meeting last Thursday. We worked on some of our board goals. Um, it was a productive meeting, um, and we do have a meeting planned for Saturday, uh, November 20th, about continuing our work, and we will discuss how we're going to move forward at the end of this meeting um, in Section F, Action and Discussion Items. So we'll be having a brief discussion about that. And then we do have a busy week coming up for some of our members. A member Chastang will be attending Grand Nationals um, in Indianapolis, which is the culminating event mm -hmm. of the marching band season. Yes, they've done such a great job. 
Um, so good luck, safe travels. Thank you. So and much. good luck and safe travels to the band and all the staff that goes with mm -hmm. them. It's quite a production if you've never seen them leave. Yeah. <laughs> Semis and buses. Um, so good luck. And then member Sadu is going to be traveling up to Grand Rapids and attending the MASB Annual Leadership Conference um, there. And we're really happy that she agreed to represent us in the Delegate Assembly. Mm -hmm. Also have safe travels and have a productive meeting. Thank you. And that is pretty much it. I will be move, we will be moving on to Student Re Performance and Achievement Re Committee. Thank you, President McCoyne. We did meet Last week, right? Yes. Time is flying. <laughs> no, it does. Uh, we had a great meeting. You know, when we talk about kids and how we take care of kids and teachers, it's always a really great productive meeting. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot about what's happening with the social emotional support and social emotional learning, um, all levels, K pre K twelve, as well as staff, because we know that is a greatest need right now. So uh, we were, um, thanks to uh, Ms. Rail and her team, we got an overview of what's happening at the elementary level, middle school, high school levels. And we also got an overview of the student wellness and pre prevention initiative and all the goals that they are targeting for this year. So we got a deep dive into the panoramic tool. Some of you may recall that we actually got a sneak peek of that last year. That was a tool that was purchased to get some of the data for the SEL support. So it's really nice to kind of get a glimpse of what's going on in there and the initial rollout at the high school level. So that will be coming to the board at some point when they have more data to share. So that is exciting. We uh, started to touch on some of the student achievement data and academic gaps um, that we know are prevalent that we continue to work at and work toward. So we're gonna do a deeper dive of that in December. So if anyone's interested in looking at and having a discussion around our data, please come to our December meeting, which is going to be on December 1, 5 p.m. in this room. Thank you. All right, next up is policy, and that is my meeting. We have not met since um, the last board meeting. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, December 7th. Um, because we only have one meeting in December, we usually only meet policy one, either in November or December, so we decided to do it in December this year because Thanksgiving is the week of our next board meeting. Um, it will be 5.30 most likely in the collaboration space, which is the end of this um, floor. Kind of have to find it. Um, <coughs> I usually hope somebody's there I can follow. Um, so um, on the agenda tonight was our bylaw uh, 0167.3, public participation in board meetings. Um, so what we have done with that and the agenda is we have kind of tried to clarify things that were in both and have them in both places and clarify the procedures a bit more. Um, also, um, how we're going to do citizens' comments, um, just to make sure that's codified in our policy. So we will be collecting the cards prior to the meeting start. That will be effective January 11th, 2022. So that will be on the agendas and online prior to that, so everyone has plenty of notice. So um, in case you see that, we're also going to rework um, the form so people have more information about it. Um, so that will be coming. And of course, everyone is welcome to come to our next meeting. And next up is finance and operations. Thank you. We met last Thursday and we reviewed the financial statements for the, just one second, I'm trying to find what month that was, <laughs> the month of September, thank you. <laughs> and we discussed some of the challenges that we're having in construction at the, uh, the high school programs and what we're doing there. We'll hear more about that. We reviewed the radio purchase that will be on the agenda for this evening. We d talked about some of the struggles and challenges that we're having in transportation and custodial, which will continue to have additional discussions on there and how to best address those and the struggles that we're having in hiring across the district. Our next meeting is Thursday, November 18th at uh, 5 p.m. It's here in this room and we welcome the community to attend.
Thank you. And then we have a brand new committee that will be starting. If you would like to say a few words about it, Member Chastain. Oh, I'm on the, uh, hello, I get to speak to you guys again. <laughs> so we are um, refreshing, if you will, because it was a previously existing committee. And so we are going to refresh our legislative action committee. Um, we are looking forward to getting involved in a deeper way, things that impact our school and our community. And so I'm really excited about um, leading that committee and invite all of those who want to be engaged and a part of it. Um, I'm sure it's a process, we're gonna post it up. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, they know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you have it. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. So we are at D, which is Administrative Reports and Recommendations. First up is the Superintendent's Report. Thank you, President McCoy. And I never miss an opportunity to brag about our amazing students and staff whenever given this platform. And I had to pull back Principal Hill, not even thinking about the coincidence of him being here and speaking about how grateful he is for Mr. Squires this evening. We are extremely grateful for you, Principal Hill, and your leadership with uh, your bird students and staff. As we talk about the challenges that we're facing with transportation and our uh, hiring shortages, there was an action that came from their heart to acknowledge our bus drivers. I'm gonna share some pictures here. Principal Hill and staff and students, um, they joined, they work with their parent group, I believe, and just um, recognized and honored our amazing bus drivers for the professionals that they are and just really fought, for shared their thanks for just providing the support for our students, getting them to and from school and showing up each and every day. I think we have six drivers on your team, Principal Hill. Um, they gave them personalized mugs, uh, gift cards, but I think what was even more exciting and appreciative of our drivers is that our students, staff, parents were there to give them a round of applause and show their appreciation and really thank them for their commitment because as we continue to talk about filling these positions, it's so important to show that we value and appreciate our amazing staff that stay with us each and every day. So the Bird Thunderbirds and all of PCCS continue to appreciate how drivers work so hard to get our students to and from school each day. And again, Principal Hill, thank you for your leadership, for your kind heart and just thinking of ways to support our PCCS family. Also, would like to give a shout out today to uh, Miss Deborah Cohn. She works at Starkweather. If you uh, remember Miss Cohn, she is our art and world language teacher. And I'm um, sharing some pictures as well that um, an experience she brought for our students working with the Detroit Institute of Arts Department of Learning and Audience Engagement. She put together a one hour online field trip <laughs> called Shaping Identity. And students had previously viewed a diverse set of artwork using visual thinking strategies and inquiry-based classroom conversation so the students would be familiar with the question and answer style that was being used. Sharing these pictures of their experience, it was wonderful. The DIA representatives introduced our Starkweather students to a range of art from different cultures, selecting paintings that inspire, make learners think deeply, and make them see the power of visual art to communicate ideas about inclusion, representation, diversity, social justice, and truth. Among the DIA collection pieces she shared was the artwork of Edward Bannister, Michelaine Thomas, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, and Titus Kafar. Kafar. The program was offered without cost to our Starkweather students as the DIA offers free programs to schools from Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County. And we just wanna thank again Ms. Cohn for uh, bringing creative and innovative uh, experiences for our students so that they can have exceptional learning experiences. I also like to recognize our curriculum and instruction team, our instructional coaches for the amazing professional learning day they had for our teachers last week. That is hard work to pull off at professional learning and trying to do that in a virtual setting but uh, we really learned something, I'm gonna say, through our experiences last year, that um, being able to offer this and give some flexibility around being able to do it synchronously and asynchronously has been a welcomed um, uh, new way of learning for our teachers, especially as they're juggling so much on their plate. So when we look at uh, this window, these, the majority of the staff were able to participate in these learning opportunities and 
Um, I wanted to just share some information. This is some feedback that some of our teachers shared with that team. Remember, and I want to thank the board, you supported us in the increase of instructional coaches. I believe that we started with five, uh, did we have five full-time before? And now we're up to seven full-time and five part-time instructional coaches. And they're working again to support our teachers with implementing teaching practices, analyzing data, determining small group needs, creating lesson uh, resources, and being think partners for our staff. So I just kind of wanted to share a few um, pieces of feedback that came from that learning. One teacher said the PD was informative, practical, and engaging. An added bonus, we walked away with an activity we could implement in our classrooms. A number of staff members commented about the amazing work and that they really enjoyed the PD. Another teacher talked about the courses were well planned and many of the colleagues also have enjoyed them. They've learned a ton while teaching in a beyond challenging year and this little measure to create PD in a new way for us was a gem. Finally, one comment said, I wanted to express my gratitude for reinventing professional development and how to best use your coaching team. Your team has been invaluable this year and we couldn't have done it without you all. So that is Dr. Deirdre Brady and her team of curriculum um, instructional coaches and our curriculum coordinators um, work so hard to provide this professional learning for our teachers and I appreciate the work that they continue to do on behalf of students each and every day. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Vartanian Gibbs and her team. As you know, she's had a couple of job fairs and wanted to share some success. Uh, this week they had a, last week, they had an in-person job fair. The previous week they had a virtual job fair. So just trying to find all ways to fill these various positions across our district. And the success of this job fair, the team reported that they were able to t sign up 12 people to be substitute teachers, one employee for the ABM uh, services, that's our custodial services, and others are moving to a second round to be paraprofessionals and healthcare technicians. So it was definitely a successful effort. I appreciate you and your team for uh, getting the word out, advertising, and being there to um, really kind of also streamline the process, covering fingerprints, and that is some work that we're continuing to do to ensure that um, we bring the best uh, employees to be a part of our team to help support our students. So that is it for me today. As I bring closure, I just want to continue to remind our entire school community we are still in high levels of spread in our community with COVID-19, and I know there is COVID fatigue and people are tired, but we need to remain vigilant. We need to ensure that we're doing our daily screenings for our students. As they come into school each day, we want to make sure that we keep our doors open for in-person learning, and we're only able to do so when it is safe to do so. And so we've had some of our numbers that, it, that have impacted our ability for continuity of learning this week. We just want to continue to remind each other uh, to do those daily screenings, and it's okay. If you are not feeling well or even feel like you have symptoms that are suggestive of COVID, to stay home, and we will ensure that the learning environment for students is not impacted. So with that, I will end my report today. All right, thank you. So now we are on to finance and operations with Ms. Piaz. First up, we have an action item 2211-22, consider approval of a resolution technology department restructuring final reading. Does anybody have any questions about this? We did see a presentation at our last meeting about this. But Mr. Salzer is here if anybody has any questions. No? Okay, so I am then looking for a motion. Madam President, I move that we consider approval of a resolution for the technology department restructuring. This will be a final reading. The action item is 22-11-22. All right, thank you. Second. So it's been moved by Member Kehoe and seconded by Member Brooks that we consider approval of resolution technology department restructuring final reading action item 22-11-22 i will call for the vote all in favor say yes. yes yes any opposed say no all right seven zero next up is uh consider approval of resolution for two-way radio purchase first reading good evening <laughs> This was presented at the f &L meeting uh, last week on the 4th of November and discussed with the committee at that time um, for the purchase of uh, t new two-way radios. This is just a, a subset of the entire um, uh, universe we have of, of radios. And I have Mr. Tiskowitz here to explain um, 
in general what, what the um, uh, motion is about this evening. Thank you, Ms. Piaz. Um, before you tonight, we're asking uh, for a purchase of 300 two-way radios. Um, these radios are used at all of our buildings for uh, supervision. Um, we found that the with the increased number of uh, supervisors that we had to add due to social distancing and, and kids eating in different places and being divided into, into multiple locations, we need, had a uh, need for an increase uh, with our communication tool that we use to uh, communicate. So we also received some additional information in our board packet um, with respect to the, the, the different uh, quotes originally when we had these, we only had the leading quote, but it's, it's best practice that we always look at both quotes that are here and there's a substantial price difference between the two vendors. Um, Kurt, as I understand it, there's a number, there's an, an, an urgent need for these and also some concerns with respect to the, uh, the availability um, of of devices, electronic devices like this due to chip shortages and supply chain disruptions. That's is, correct. Is that correct? So given that, I'd like to, to move that we make this a first and final reading. Um, Patty, is there something we have to do to do that? Do I just need to make um, We have to have an action item, which I'm gonna say would be 22-11-23. That's yep. correct. 22-11-23 would be the action item. And you would have to just make a motion for that. So before I do that, is there any other questions that people have before we make that motion? Actually, can you restate? I know we had the two. No, I'm gonna answer my own question. I'd be happy to explain it for yourself and the community if there's questions. No, my question is answered, but I'm sure that if anybody else has any, they'll Okay, answer. great. Okay, so I'd like to consider approval of a resolution for purchase of two-way, uh, or I'm sorry, for two-way radio purchase. This would be a first and final reading. The action item would be 22-11-23. Okay, I'm looking for a second. Second. All right, it was moved by Member Kehoe and seconded by Member Brooks that we consider approval of resolution for two-way radio purchase as a first and final reading. Action item 22-11-23. Does anybody have any further questions on this? Are we just approving it blanket or are we for picking a specific company or not to exceed, say, 120,000? What are we, what are we? It's a, it's a great question. So we list both of the vendors there, but we've actually made the recommendation to purchase them from uh, Bearcom. Okay. So that, that was the purchase uh, recommendation. Normally what we want to do is we want to make sure we show all mm -hmm. of the, normally we wouldn't show that in the board meeting. We mm -hmm. would have showed that in the, um, in the F&O discussion, mm -hmm. but we didn't have that information there. So Bearcom is the preferred vendor. They're not to exceed prices, $119,613. They anticipate that there may be some savings mm -hmm. when they review some of our existing technology and equipment there that they may not need to replace everything. So in which case it may be less than that. So the not to exceed Perfect. price would be $119,613. Perfect, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Anybody else have any questions? All right, I will call for the vote. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed say no. All right. Um, next up, we are on to citizens' comments. At this point, I have one. Uh, Mr. LaPointe. Yes. Come on up. Uh, you have three minutes. Mr. Brandon will time us. Oh um, state your name I'll, and then start. <laughs> By Wendy, which means I go a long time. <laughs> Do you still require my address and all that? No, we just just your name. Last time, well, I'm Mark Lapointe, and I met most of you board members in the summertime. I got the extra miler award. Mm -hmm. uh, it's framed and on the wall at home, but I was going to bring it tonight in case you wanted it back <laughs> after I get done talking to you. Um, I am currently volunteering time at East Middle School. I'm running a lunchtime intramural program for the kids over there. Uh, I did that for five years at Liberty and I'm coaching the girls volleyball team. Matter of fact, we had a match tonight. Thanks for the buses, for the limos. Mm -hmm. The kids are really excited about <laughs> that. Uh, but anyhow, um, since we started in August, half of our gym is dark. We have no lights in our gym on one side. And we're at the point in time where we're considering 
changing our, our home games to all away games. And I don't think that's fair to the kids. I think our girls deserve to play at home. Um, and the lights have been out since August. And I would like to see some expediency in getting them turned on. Um, we talk about how much we are for kids, and we rightfully are. So kids need a well-lighted gym. And the other thing I'd like you to do is, if you've ever seen, uh, remember the Titans? <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever seen Hoosiers, if you came into East Gym, that's where you would be. East Gym is circa 1957, folks, mm -hmm. and it's still that way today. The superstructure for the baskets. How am I doing on time, Nick? You're good, Coach. Okay. Oh. <laughs> The superstructure for the for the baskets is 1957, and we need to take a look at upgrading that gym. That gym was built for one sport and one sport only: basketball. For boys, the girls' locker rooms are inadequate. The ladies don't play with a good gym in mind. You can't play volleyball real well in East when you got a gym roof that's shaped like this. Mm. It's kind of hard. So. Anyhow, that would require a dome and lifting it and all kinds of stuff, but I think we need to take a little look at East. In the past, East has been looked upon as the stepchild in the middle school world around here, and I, I just think, I think we need to look at East a little bit closer, so I appreciate the time. And by the way, Nellie Bird was a neighbor of mine, <laughs> and I grew up next door to her, so if you any ever want any Nellie Bird stories, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. If you guys need me to break up the, me the, the meeting a little bit, I'll come in anytime. There you go. So three, two, one, I'm dropping the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, come visit us at East. I, I can't stay any longer. So right. <laughs> we had a game tonight and again, and I'm, my wife is waiting anxiously for all right, is there anybody else that wanted to speak? All right. So now we are on to F, which is action items and discussion. So the first up is discussion on the board priorities. So we had a meeting on Thursday with Karen Cross, who was awesome, by the way. I thought she was awesome. <laughs> um, I believe other people also thought she was awesome. So we decided that we need to really kind of take a look at our priorities for uh, the remainder of the, the year and the school year and um, decide what we wanted to do. So we kind of came up to the idea that we needed to um, work on our dynamic plan to get our part done. Um, and then we need to do superintendent goals and the superintendent evaluation process and the board evaluation. So we do have a meeting for November 20th that we'd already set. Ms. Cross is available on November 20th if we would like to keep her and work with her and move forward. I would welcome any discussion on that. Everybody able to make the November 20th time? Yeah, wasn't that the day and time we all like held on our calendars? Correct. Yes. 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 Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. That date still works for me. Okay. Good. So as, as long as that date works, I think that's a, a, a good use of our time to be able to do that because we have had some scheduling challenges mm -hmm. um, yes. and be able to take advantage of that time to get together. Yes. A nice day when we're fresh in the morning and get some good work done. Mm -hmm. All right. What time? Uh, it's at 10. It's President McQueen, is it here or are we doing it off site? It, it's here. It's here. So it's November 20th at 10 to 1. And I set out a calendar invite a while ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. Most people said yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just reminding you that it's there. Yes, and we also kind of decided that we would pause 
We would pause our high impact school governance work, having too many different things to do. Um, some of that work will be covered in doing board goals, like tightening up our procedures and policies and things like that. We would get those done anyway with this, um, but not, but to not be working with two or three different consultants at the same time is becoming confusing. Also, it is a it is a challenge for us to get dates cleared for eight people to meet. So um, we're going to pause that for the time being and work on the more pressing issues and then go back to that at a certain time. Now, now that we're uh, moving in this direction, who would you like to work on the uh, timeline for the dynamic plan? As a part of this evening's special study session, we're going to talk through that and kind of just get some ideas on based on what we heard the other night at our workshop and then what we think is a good timeline for us. So that'll be a part of this evening's discussion. Perfect. Did anybody have anything else? I, I did have one other okay. thing unrelated to that topic. Okay. Um, Ms. Merritt, we haven't received our, um, our quarantine numbers for this week, and we have been seeing a significant increase in number of cases. Um, I'm especially concerned in seeing the quarantine numbers. They haven't been going up as high as they were in the spring, but they certainly are going up, and we've taken some really strong precautions this year to make sure that we don't have quarantines. The rules that allow us to avoid a quarantine if students are vaccinated or if they're um, more than three feet apart, and yet we still have hundreds of students that are out on quarantine as of last week. And I, don't, I haven't seen the numbers. I know they normally come on Tuesday. Tuesday yeah. So, I mean, it is Tuesday. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you have the numbers for, for right now yet. I will get out of my email box. They probably have been sent this evening. They've had quite a few, couple of busy days, yes. Okay. So are we, ex I assume that we're going to see an increase in those quarantines. And can you perhaps share why we're seeing quarantines given the, um, the processes that we've had in place to ensure three feet distancing, to ensure six feet at lunch, to not have to quarantine students who are vaccinated, to not have to uh, quarantine students that are, um, that are more than three feet apart. I would expect that we wouldn't be having quarantines right now. Yeah, and so um, it's a great question. We're definitely seeing, I would say, an increase and our younger students, so we've seen a decrease in our high school students um, that still would be potentially exposed, um, but not having to quarantine because of the fact that they're vaccinated, for example. So if you even look at our latest situation at Pioneer, our biggest hit is around the sixth grade um, area, and I think that that could account for that. When we're looking at lunch, um, when students are unmasked um, and uh, would still be identified at that point, and if they don't meet the other options, um, then they would still have to quarantine. There's uh, some challenges I think that we're experiencing as well where it's hard to really determine um, school associated cases and has the transmission occurred at school. Our students, um, our friends, they hang together outside of school. You know, um, if they have events and that's a part of the contact tracing process where they're, they're together outside of school but then they're in school, and at lunch, for example, there's a positive case. They have been unmasked while they're eating. We still have to count if there is an exposure that is a school-associated case. So when we look to our numbers over the last week in particular, um, we've seen a spike um, in about two weeks, actually. Our middle schools have really been identified as areas where we've seen, uh, I think currently we have West Middle School, Discovery Middle School, Liberty Middle School have been um, uh, reported on our state site. Um, we were also following a case uh, with Salem. I think it was an athletic advance team case that was last month. Um, but again, our numbers have not been as great at the high school because you have that ability to exempt. And um, we, in, in a, uh, most of our schools, as you know from the beginning, we've had the ability to staff for the appropriate uh, distance. And just even looking at our class sizes right now, um, for the most part across the district, they are within those uh, confines of three feet. Um, we had some furniture uh, needs that we're gonna look to address at one of our schools that um, may help um, in that particular space to just ensure that um, we're greater than, 
than three feet, the number of students that we have in there versus the furniture is also something that we're looking at. But for the most part, we're able to deal with the spacing and our class sizes accommodate for that. The bigger piece, I would say, is when we have um, those spaces where students are unmasked. Okay, because I, I, while we were talking, I actually looked at the link that you gave us from last week, and it does, the numbers are updated. Um, so we went from 217 um, students and staff that were out on quarantine, or students, um, number of people that were out on quarantine, to 341. Mm -hmm. So in less than one week, it's like a 60% jump in the, in the number of people that are out in quarantine. And with the precautions that we have in place, this just doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I know you've, 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 you've mentioned some things, but I don't know whether we're being diligent about the, the distancing that we need to do. I mean, we just, we saw these kinds of numbers last spring. Um, you know, just massive impact on, the, uh, on, our, on our district. And the numbers, yes, were a little bit higher. They were in the 500s. Yes. But we're quickly approaching those kinds of levels. So I and do want to assure you, I don't. disruption is not. Yes. I will, uh, a couple of things I want to share. I don't have the numbers in front of me that you just opened, so I can't refer to exactly what you're saying, but I can look at that and get you a more uh, detailed answer. Um, when we had, for example, a situation such as where I shared with the schools, by the process with the Wayne County Health Department, they come out and do a case review. And so they validated that we are following our mitigation plans as prescribed. There is um, a higher frequency of spread in certain variants of, of COVID-19, but they have indicated and we get the report that we are indeed following our mitigation plans as, um, as, as, as prescribed. Um, with, again, uh, the ability to exempt students from quarantine, uh, that the younger students, that has impacted those numbers. And so when possible, we're able to keep students in school I would say one thing that's better than last year, when we look at the impact on learning. Last year, we were not able to um, support, guarantee the support of, for example, that students could zoom into a classroom or have a recorded lesson. So we were scrambling, I would say, throughout that year, making sure that we were ensuring continuity of learning. We've had the ability this year to work with our, our teachers to come up with a system to support students so when they are not able to be there in person due to a quarantine situation, at this point we're following the health department's 10 days versus the 14 days. Um, some students are allowed within that exemption to test daily so that they're able to stay in school. What we're seeing in our younger students, and that's also contributing to the increase in numbers, some parents are opting not to do that test. So one of those exemptions would be if you, um, or not symptomatic, you would be able to test your students daily and then keep them in school. So some parents for their younger students are opting to just keep them home for the quarantine and because we have that support that's available to them, it's uh, providing that continuity of learning. So I think that's probably why we haven't seen, even though our numbers are high, some of the concerns that we saw last year because we're able to support them better during quarantine so it's definitely a challenge, and that's why I say in terms of being in high levels of spread, we need to, as a community, remain vigilant. Um, as I said, a lot of the contact tracing, especially the most recently linked FE link cases, there's also um, situations where students are just together outside of school. There's really nowhere else where they have to follow these mitigation plans, and they're friends in school, and they're eating lunch. And so um, I will just, to answer the question again, we are following our mitigation plans, we have uh, appropriate spacing, spacing and staffing to, um, to continue that spacing. We have then the case reviews anytime that our numbers would warrant that and the Wayne County Health Department is affirming that we're doing the right thing um, and it's still a high level of spread that impacts uh, our, our school community. Okay, so m my last question on this, on this area was why are we seeing staff quarantine? We're seeing, at, for example, at the park, and I, I won't name the schools, but we're seeing ACE, ACE positive staff, but six, six staff members that are out on quarantine. Do we have a problem with people not following the guidance at the staff level? Um, you know, I, no, it, so it's, no it's not a situation like that, I will share. And again, when I say that, um, I'm affirming that all mitigation plans are being followed. We have a lot of different scenarios. We may have scenarios where uh, teachers or para 
professionals are required as a nature of their job to be closer to students to provide that level of support. Um, and and, and uh, with that, in order to give students what they need, they're going to they're gonna be masked at that time, so that's not an issue, but it still could be a situation where um, there is, um, within that, the, the confines of the job, it still could lead to a quarantine type of situation. But if those staff members were vaccinated, even if they were it closer than three feet, they would not be subject to the quarantine, correct? Um, as you are aware right now, uh, it is not a mandatory condition of employment in our district to be vaccinated. So it may or may not be, which we, we don't, we, we're not getting that information from staff. We know that there is that uh, federal decision that is uh, being discussed right now and really is a stay. In the event that that uh, decision moves forward, that's a mandatory vaccination, then MIOSHA would have 30 days in which to respond. So we as a school district are in a kind of a, just a wait to see what that looks like. But currently, that is not a condition of employment here within our district. And so, um, you know, a, again, and not to, to I want to just make sure that we're staying in, and I appreciate you not asking the question specifically, but just as it even relates to schools. Um, I, I will answer it the best way that people are definitely following their mitigation uh, plans as put in place. And even with that, we will still have situations where people are exposed. And because of not meeting certain, certain exemptions, they're still required to quarantine. Okay, because obviously it's a substantial disruption to the district and to our, our, our working and learning environment. So I, I, I'm disappointed. May I share mm -hmm. um, a little bit? So um, what I'd like to share, because I am I'm, I'm part of looking at the COVID-19 chart on a daily basis is that um, we have people who've been vaccinated and they would test positive and they have symptoms so they have to stay home and that might be some of the data that you're looking at. Sure that would make sense for why that person is out but mm -hmm. it would not make sense why there's others that are uh, in close contact would need to be quarantined because if those sure. other close contacts were were vaccinated they would not be required to be quarantined based upon the guidelines that we have from the Wayne County Health Department and my concern is not that people are getting sick. I mean, that's something that we can't prevent mm -hmm. uh, per se, but having the quarantines is something that's entirely within our control. And that's the thing that is disappointing to me. Yeah. And I w will say without getting too much further in the discussion as well, and we could talk a little bit more offline, but we're also experiencing a significant breakthrough um, where we have vaccinated staff that are actually coming up positive as well. Yeah. So yep. we're, we're, we're looking at that data as well. Um, but again, I just want to emphasize from this level that um, our staff is doing what they need to do to follow our guidelines, to keep our school community safe. That is then affirmed by the review of any case, case that has been reported then as an EpiLink uh, when the health department comes in to do their review. So um, it's definitely just a challenge in the middle of this pandemic. And again, I go back to my original point of as a whole community, we have to remain vigilant and realize as much COVID fatigue as there is, we are truly in high levels of spread right now and numbers are going up, even evidenced by this weekend's numbers of two days averages. So we just wanna make sure that another piece is the reporting mechanism we're dealing at times, again, where um, families feel concerned about sharing who they may have been with and so they, that information is not shared with us and that impacts our contact tracing process and then a student may come up you know and, and so we have it just it's it's a lot going on we have to continue to work together as our community uh to keep our our schools safe okay. so i have one wondering about this as well as you all discuss it i'm thinking is there any correlation at all when we see clusters with kids who are actually bused together like so is there a correlation and, it, and you may not have that answer but if we're talking about younger kids, when they're on the buses, we can we can say, wear your mask, don't sit. But just to be honest, yeah. so I was just wondering, if we've looked at that data, should you look at that data, particularly for the clusters? Is it is transmission happening in the transportation piece? Yeah, it's a great question, and that is a part of the review. And so we have had um, positive cases that have been on the bus. At this time, we have not had one uh, example of a transmission that is bus related. Um, the transmissions that we have seen um, have either been situations that, you know, that I've shared where there's ha there has to be less than and there's an unmasked situation such as eating um, or uh, multiple areas where students may have associated outside of school being on, you know, certain teams outside of school together and then they're also friends at school and socialize. And so um, the good news with the, that we do track all of that information and we have not to date had from a positive case on the bus of secondary transmission. Okay, so 
what I was just wondering. Yeah, very good question. Thank you for that discussion. Mm -hmm. I will look forward to the day where we won't have to have a COVID <laughs> discussion, but as long as we are in it, we will talk yeah, about it. Wouldn't that be great? It will be great. Mm -hmm. All right. Does anybody else have anything? Uh, from an agenda building standpoint, yes. if, if we could look at uh, a discussion around or a presentation around race-based drama. So we, we know that there's been several incidents uh, this year around race-based trauma. would like to understand you know, uh, is there truly an increase in them? Also, what's being done to decrease them? How we're tracking them, and then what our our uh, our strategy is long term around them. I just want to restate that part yes. about tracking. Like, how I would want to really mm -hmm. understand how it's reported to Done. whom. So the tracking piece is really important to me. And from a what's being done standpoint, I know we're doing a lot in the district overall, but specifically when something occurs, what happens within the first 24 hours, mm -hmm. 48, 72, three months, six months, how, how are we treating and what kind of support are we providing to the students who are on the, the other end of the trauma? Mm -hmm. Could we also maybe get, make sure that everybody's clear on how to report that and who they would report to? Mm -hmm. All right, did anybody else have anything for a future agenda topic? Uh, and as a reminder, you can always send them in to uh, Superintendent Merritt or to me if you come up with something else. So at our last meeting for follow-up board questions, uh, Member Wilson had asked about uh, the portion of the bond 2020, um, the por what portion of those funds have been spent to date? And we got that in the board notes. Correct. Thank you, Ms. Piaz. And so then from tonight, we have something we want added to the workshop. A work well, added to our agenda. Mm -hmm and the race-based trauma. Did anybody else have anything else they needed to have followed up on? Besides maybe some of the um, COVID information? Did you, did you want, did you have any further questions, Ms. Tracy? Okay. No. Okay. She, I, 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 you said you were collecting the data, so I'm assuming we're looking at it regularly to make sure that we aren't having clusters mm -hmm. associated with transportation and that we're following the strategies to s disinfect and sanitize and all of that. So because you're collecting it, if I ask again, we can say whether or not there's correlation. Yes, okay. that I don't is have correct. any more questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, I do have a question okay. regard, you know, regarding the COVID discussion too. You know, I know you, you were, um, Member Kehoe was talking a lot about um, the, the numbers around our younger students and, and mm -hmm. sixth grade and younger. And I know we had a couple pop-up vaccination clinics. Are we going to be doing that again now that the vaccines have been opened up to ages 5 to 12? Yes. Yeah, so um, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services with the Wayne County Health Department will also, um, they look for takers to host these pop-up sites. So we yeah. volunteer to be a host. Um, looking at just the, the volume, they anticipated that we potentially would need three sites here at school, so mm -hmm. we, uh, in our district, so we gave them three sites. Now we're waiting to hear back from them to confirm, but I am pretty confident that if we say yes, then they will bring the staff to make it happen. So Great. as soon as we find out, we'll let you know and we'll get that advertisement out to our community. Thank you. 
one, one other thing um, which just triggered based on the increased numbers from a quarantine standpoint, that's where so much of our learning loss or uh, um, unfinished learning uh, occurred last year. If we could add to in the future agenda item an update on unfinished learning, you know, we looked at those numbers, you know, what are we doing to, to close that gap to support those youth and then also keeping our eyes on the increased quarantine numbers <laughs> and making sure that, you know, we don't have yeah, correct that we're uh, supporting those students, which I know we've made a lot of changes. So it would be great to um, just highlight those uh, to make sure we're not compounding the uh, unfinished learning that occurred last year. Um, also, uh, Ms. Rail uh, mm -hmm. is leading a committee. We turned, uh, added an unfinished learning committee and it might be good we'll be for in. us to um, maybe even uh, kind of more of an, I think in systems way, add a report at our board meetings just about the work of that committee because it's not a board committee so we wouldn't have a place here but maybe find a place on the agenda so we can really talk about progress and, and, and things that we're doing. Yeah. Um, that community uh, well, committee yeah. is just starting to form I think they're gonna yep. try to get some first meetings here in November yep there's a, the, a invite went out to the committee members who indicated that they wanted to continue and that first meeting will be next Monday night so we'll meet the next three Mondays and then continue the work beyond we'll also be putting together an unfinished learning plan that will be shared with both the board and the community that talks about all of the work that's been done and then the work that will be done moving forward. Additionally, it will also um, inform the work that we submit to the state around our ESSER funds, our mm -hmm. next round of ESSER funds. So, um, and we would recommend and really request that any community member who has great ideas to share with us that please do so. We'll have plenty of venues to do that because we know that we have a lot of great collective thinking and we've done a lot of work around the summer and into the fall to help address unfinished instruction but we also know that we have our own framing through our lens and you know other people have ideas to bring to the table to share with us as well so we certainly look forward to hearing from our community members and our partners in learning so from a process standpoint could we have that reported after a newbum does spa sort of connected mm -hmm. to yeah we actually talked about that in spa this it yeah. was part of the agenda and Beth was saying mm -hmm. this is something that they're working on and we did talk about how do we integrate that into spa mm -hmm. you know is it a is it an update in spa then I report out mm -hmm. or is it something that we report out monthly in more detail from Beth so I mean I think that's even for the spa members let's um, let's discuss that in terms of what makes sense for the spa committee too yeah, I think that's a good idea All right, anything else? All right, so we have come to the end of our agenda. We will be adjourning to a special meeting on the MyKIP plan and learning plan goals. So just um, for people who are here, this is a public meeting. Um, you are more than welcome to stay um, for this meeting. It is, however, not going to be taped because it is a workshop. So. Um, we will be adjourning this meeting. It is 7.59 and to. President McCoy, can you just explain what my KIP is for those people that are in attendance? I can do it if you'd like, <laughs> or it's up to you, Patty. Oh, go ahead, it's Michigan. Michigan Continuous Improvement um, Process. So it's Michigan Continuous, in fact, I'm gonna actually get the, cor the correct framing because there's a, I wanna make sure that I don't miss the Continuous yep. improvement process. Michigan Integrated Continuous Improvement Process. So it, you think about in the old school framing, district and school improvement planning. So it's the, it's the new and improved model of that from the state level. I'm just making sure that those in attendance know what this is so that they can make the decision if they want to attend or not. Good idea, thank you. All right, so um, it is 7.59. This meeting is adjourned. Um, we will take about five minutes, and then we will get started. Thank you so much.